Dominic. So we have uh, a new employee with us tonight. Dominic Nacarado is uh, going to be handling our microphone. So it's his first meeting. So if we could uh, welcome Dominic. He goes to Cora. What grade are you in, Dominic? 10. He's in grade 10 at Cora. So uh, this is So we're going to cut Dominic a little slack tonight as he uh, moves around with the microphones. But welcome to council, Dominic. Um, Madam Clerk, if uh, I can actually, before I, I we get going, I just want to recognize and thank all the media and broadcast partners for participating in broadcasting and reporting on our meetings. Madam Clerk, if you can please call the meeting to order. Okay. I have a motion by Councilor Thomas Wilson Gordy that the minutes of regular meeting of Council June 3, 2019, be approved. All in favor. Carried. Don't ask for it. It'll, it'll give me a, a better off not doing it. Yeah. Um, under agenda item four, a uh, motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Scott resolved that the agenda for June 17, 2019 City Council meeting as presented be approved. All in favor? Carried. And under agenda item five, 5.1 World Refugee Day, uh, Megan Douglas is in attendance. Welcome to Council, Megan. Thank you. It's great to be You're here. You're at Sault Ste. Marie. I am for another week. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Always good to come back. Dear Mr. Mayor and Council, currently over 68 million people around the world are displaced, having had to flee their homes because of violence, persecution, or oppression. Today, the members of Refugee 705 and the Sioux Community Information and Career Centre are requesting that our City Council proclaim June 20th as World Refugee Day in Sault Ste. Marie. This International Day, on the 20th of June annually, was first declared by the United Nations General Assembly in 2000 and is held around the world to build awareness, empathy, support, and respect of forcibly displaced peoples including refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, stateless persons, and returnees. It is our hope that the recognition of World Refugee Day in Sault Ste. Marie provides us with the opportunity to increase awareness and understanding of the process of integration for refugee men, women, and children, and recognize their courage, strength, and determination in starting a new life in a foreign country with dignity. Since 2015, Sault Ste. Marie has received 277 refugees from countries including Syria, Ukraine, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Eritrea, Nigeria, Central African Republic, Burma, Mali, Yemen, Rwanda, and Burundi. Our city has been challenged to exercise its individual and collective empathy as the world has come to us up here in the north. All of us at Refugee 705 and the Sioux Community Information and Career Center have been inspired by how so many of our city's citizens have selflessly demonstrated solidarity and compassion. We have also seen firsthand how so many of the refugees who have arrived here have demonstrated remarkable resilience and courage in the face of immense challenges and meaningfully contributed to the social, cultural, and economic fabric of this city. On behalf of Refugee 705, Sioux Community Information and Career Centre, WUSC Chapter at Sioux College, Local Immigration Partnership, the Downtown Association, and Northland Ad Adult Learning Centre and all of our partners, we would like to cordially invite members of City Council, City Staff, and all community members to celebrate World Refugee Day. On Thursday, June 20th, 2019, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the courtyard at 477 Queen Street East in front of the March Street State. Thank you. Thank you. A happy proclamation. Whereas the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is mandated by the United Nations General Assembly to lead and coordinate international action to project refugees and find solutions to refugee problems worldwide. And whereas it is important to recognize that Canada has a long history of helping and protecting refugees and is signatory to the 1951 United Nations Convention relating to the status of refugees in its 1967 protocol. 
And whereas the United Nations General Assembly unanimously adopted on December 4, 2000, a resolution naming June 20th of every year as World Refugee Day to build awareness, empathy, support, and respect of refugees. And whereas World Refugee Day provides us with the opportunity to increase awareness and understanding of the intricate processes of integration for refugee men, women, and children, and recognize their courage, strength, and determination in starting a new life in a foreign country with dignity. Whereas the city of Sault Ste. Marie and its people continue to welcome refugees and make resources available to them and their families so they can have a dignified life in a safe and free environment. Now therefore I, Christian Provenzano, as mayor of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim June 20th, 2019 as World Refugee Day in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Two, Canadian Multiculturalism Day. Sean Halliday, research assistant with the Local Immigration Partnership, is in attendance. Go ahead, Mr. Halliday. Welcome Good afternoon. Down. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. And thank you to the audience here. Uh, Multiculturalism Day, held each year on June 27th since the year 2002, is a day to celebrate diversity, equity and democracy and is also an opportunity for communities and the country as a whole to celebrate the varied cultures which make up Canada and to recognise the contributions different ethnic and cultural communities make to Canada. Canadian multiculturalism is fundamental to our belief that all citizens are equal. Multiculturalism ensures that all citizens can keep their identities can take pride in their ancestry and have a sense of belonging. Acceptance gives Canadians a feeling of security and self-confidence, making them more open to and accepting of diverse cultures. The Canadian experience has shown that multiculturalism encourages racial, racial and ethnic harmony and cross-cultural understanding. Through multiculturalism, Canada recognises the potential of all Canadians encouraging them to integrate into society and to take an active part in its social, cultural, economic and political affairs. While our shared values and commitment to freedom and equality have certainly enabled Canada to prosper, this would have been impossible without our unique ability to draw upon a variety of influences and traditions from around the world. Canadian multiculturalism has ultimately come to symbolise our collective commitment to realise a, a more just and humane world. On behalf of the Local Immigration Partnership, the Sioux Community Career Centres in to the Sioux, Refugee 705, Global Friends and Sioux College's World University Service of Canada programme, we would like to cordially invite the Mayor, Council members and the public to join us at the Common Link Hall in Sioux College on Thursday, June 27, 2019, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. for an appreciation and celebration of culture through food, music, and entertainment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Halliday. I have your proclamation here. Whereas on November 13, 2002, the Government of Canada by Royal Proclamation designated June 27th of each year as Canadian Multiculturalism Day. And whereas Canadian Multiculturalism Day is an opportunity to celebrate our diversity and our commitment to democracy, <coughs> equality, and mutual respect, and to appreciate the contributions of the various multicultural groups and communities to Canadian society. Whereas the concept of diversity encompasses acceptance and respect and recognizes that each individual is unique. This includes race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical ability, religious belief, political belief, or other ideology. A community that values Diversity moves beyond simple tolerance to embracing and celebrating the uniqueness of each individual. Now, therefore, I, Christian Provenzano, as mayor of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim June 27, 2019, as Canadian Multiculturalism Day and invite all members of the community to take part in Canadian Multiculturalism Day to acknowledge, celebrate, and embrace our diverse and cultural past, present, and future. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hall. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Under agenda. Under agenda item 5.3, Green Team, Tate Nowak, and members of the city's Green Team are in attendance. Welcome to Council, Tate. 
Thank you. Tate is the summer student in my office, and I can tell everybody unequivocally that she is awesome. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Provenzano, members of City Council, and senior staff. My name is Tate Nowak. I am the summer student working in the mayor's office. I am one of many students who work within the Civic Center and in the city. This year, students have come together and created the Green Team. Behind me are the members of the Green Team, and I would like to introduce them all. First, I have Alex Costain, Eileen Hartford, Miranda DiGasparo, Natalie Doherty, Daniel Turco, Denver Lambert, and then we have Samantha Cotramilio, and not in attendance are Maya Denning and Christine Palumbo. I would also like to thank you, thanks Steve Butland, former mayor and city councilor, as he has shared his knowledge and expertise of bringing green initiatives to the city in the past and helping us this year. Also Madison Zupa, who is our environmental service area coordinator here in the city, for sitting on the committee with us and helping. Our mission is to commit and raise awareness of local environmental issues and promote green, green initiatives through education and engagement to help generate a positive overall impact in our community. As young leaders, we know it is up to us to create change so that future generations can benefit from clean waterways and healthy environment. Change will come through education and awareness and we are hoping to share this with you this summer. We are ready for all generations to hop on the bandwagon of practicing green habits every day. Because of this consumer lifestyle we live, advance, it advances the importance of acting in environmentally conscious ways to protect our environment, bodies of water, and our landfills. To bring awareness to these subjects, the Green Team has planned public engagements that will occur over the summer. Our first event will be the Water Walk. The Water Walk will be an informative walk along St. Mary's River on the boardwalk. We will be educating the public and city employees about different environmental problems we have with the river. As we educate you on the problem, we would also like to suggest solutions of how you can safeguard our waterways and fix bad habits. Stations will be set up along the boardwalk at various locations. The first 100 participants in the walk will receive a prize once completing the walk. The walk will be taking place on Wednesday, June 26th, starting at City Hall at 12 p.m. and going until 2 p.m. The walk will end at Mill Market. The idea is that people who work in the downtown area are able to come down and take a quick 30-minute walk during their lunch while learning something. You can find our Facebook page with more information about the Green Team at Green Team SSM on Facebook. We would like to extend the invitation to counselors and the mayor, we would be ecstatic if you would come and show your support for this event. The event is also open to the public. We would love to have as many people as possible there showing and sharing our passion for the environment. Counselors, as you can see, we have left you a metal straw along with the information for the walk. We hope that you stop using plastic straws and start using this one instead. Thank you for your time and the green team hopes to see you on the 26th. Thank you, Tate, and Lisa and Andrew are here, and I want to thank them for their support of, of the Green Team and, and helping our youth uh, and develop their leadership skills. And Councillor Butland, uh, thank you for spending time with them. I've already thanked all of them for having the patience to spend the time with you, but I thank you for spending the time with them. Under agenda item 5.4, PUC Inc., Andy McPhee, Vice Chair, and Rob Brewer, President and CEO, are in attendance. I think uh, we might have missed the conflict declarations, Madam Clerk, so maybe yes. we can call that because uh, Council Shoemaker has a conflict on this. Please proceed, gentlemen. Um, so Sandra, uh, Councillor Hollingsworth has a uh, pecuniary interest with respect to agenda items 6.3 and 6.4, as she has a business relationship with KPMG. Okay. So, Councillor, do we have any other conflicts that need to be declared, Councillor Shoemaker? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item, which is 5.4 PUC yeah. Inc., has uh, their clients on my law firm. Thank you. Any other counselors with conflicts that we uh, need to declare? Okay. Gentlemen, so welcome to council. Uh, we're in the clerk's hands here. Do you have to put us into the shareholders meeting? So I 
have a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy resolved that City Council is now authorized to meet in open session as the sole shareholder of PUC Inc. and PUC Services Inc. And further be it resolved that City Council appoints Mayor Christian Provenzano as Council's proxy to vote on the resolutions of the shareholder of PUC Inc. and PUC Services Inc. All in favor? Carried. Okay, gentlemen, we are in our shareholders meeting. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Unfortunately, Jim Bonifero, the chair, board chair, is unable to be here tonight, so he asked me to represent him uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Andy McPhee, and I'm the vice chair of the PUC Services, Inc. Uh, before we get into uh, the, tonight's presentation, I want to take a few minutes and comment on uh, a few of uh, the board's uh, initiatives from last year. As you may recall, 2018 started with a change in leadership at the PUC. We welcomed a new president and CEO whose clear mandate is to grow the business, increase shareholder value, and strive for operational excellence. Uh, the results that we will be, will be presented to you tonight definitely, in, in my opinion, indicate that the organization is going in the right direction in these three areas. The other item I'd just like to bring to, to your attention is that the organization continues to execute our strategic plan that was established in 2017. The strategic plan is a living document which is evaluated regularly to ensure it captures significant changes and opportunities at the industry as the industry and business evolves. From uh, the board's perspective, we've had a successful year in 2018, and I'll turn it over to Rob to give you some of the detail. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Mr. McPhee. Mr. Brewer. So thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. So before we get into tonight's presentation, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the uh, sustainability reports. That's the orange folder that's in front of you. That is the PUC's uh, new form of an annual report. So it includes both financial information, but also a lot of the important things that go on with respect to strategic initiatives and community initiatives. So tonight's presentation uh, is intended as something of a summary of the sustainability report as we go into uh, a fair amount of detail in that report. And the PowerPoint is intended to, uh, to be a quick overview of some of the key points. So these reports are something that we will uh, produce every year. And while these sustainability reports have some of the traditional financial information that would be included in what you might have seen in a traditional annual report. They also include a number of information pieces that go well beyond, and they speak to the overall sustainability of the company. For example, in the sustainability report, we highlight some of the many successes that we enjoyed last year, from the unveiling of the community smart grid to the announcement of the battery storage project. And the report also highlights some of the major capital projects that we were able to complete, like our SCADA system upgrade and the successful filing of our cost of service application with the OEB. For those watching at home tonight, if you're interested in reading it, a digital copy of the report will be posted on our website tomorrow. So with that said, I can take you through the uh, presentation. So on the first two pages is our financial summaries. So the first page has PUC Inc., which is our holding company. The revenue and expenses are mainly interest driven. So there's interest that's paid out to uh, the shareholder and there's interest that's received from uh, the holdings. So it's relatively flat year to year. With respect to PUC distribution, you'll see a increase in revenue uh, from 16 to 17 and into 18. Uh, you'll also see increases of expenses in 16 to 17, but last year you'll see that we were almost a million dollars down in expenses. And that drove the increase in income. So if you look at the income line, you'll see that income in 2017 was 127,000, but income in 2018 was a little over 1.5 million. With respect to capital expenditures, we oscillate around about six million in a normal year, and we do a little over eight million in a year where we do a substation. So 2018 was consistent with the years prior. With respect to PUC services, which is where a lot of our business, um, new business avenues come in, you'll see that the, uh, the revenue in PUC services is up significantly in 2018. So it's up by uh, almost a million dollars. You'll see that once again, expenses are down by almost a little over $700,000. And so that's driven a, a significant change in income from uh, 2016, where you see just over $100,000 in income. 2017, where you see a loss of $300,000. And 2018, where you see almost 1.3 million in positive income. You've also, you can also see a significant spike in capital expenditures from 2017 into 2018, as we brought some new systems on board. 
With respect to Public Utilities Commission, which is our water utility, you'll see that revenue was up in 2018 due to higher consumption. Uh, but once again, uh, we had, even though we had a significant number of water main breaks, uh, we had a relatively flat, slightly higher on the operation expenses, but slightly lower on admin. So we see a small increase in uh, expenses. But we see an annual surplus of about $4.6 million. Now in the commission, any annual surplus is reinvested into capital. So there's no profit taken, there's no, there's no money moved out of the commission. Everything that, that is earned in the commission ends up reemployed in subsequent years in terms of capital. And you can see the CapEx, uh, last year was about 4.1 million, because one of the projects was slightly delayed. This year actually capital is expended to, or expected to be about 6 million. So there's a lot of money being reinvested back into the utility. Next slide. With respect to some of the projects we have on the go, uh, we've talked here at council about SEMA. So SEMA is still ongoing. Once complete, Sault Ste. Marie would have the largest energy storage facility of its kind in the country. Um, that project right now, we're waiting on a regulatory tweak, uh, but we hope to have that shortly. PUC also unveiled the Smart Grid project in 2018, which aims to improve system efficiency here and reduces the, influ uh, the frequency of power outages and when they occur, shorter power interruptions. This uh, particular um, investment will transform our utility from a traditional utility into a uh, significantly uh, modernized utility and has the ability to automatically control outages, has the ability to control and optimize voltage, and gives our customers significant benefits. We're also able with this project to leverage about $11.8 million in funding from Enercan, which has made it very, uh, very cost effective with respect to our customers, as they will see no net bill increase as a result of this project. So the savings from voltage optimization and the contribution from Enercan cover the entire capital expenditure. There was also a very significant SCADA upgrade on the water side where we completed uh, the installation of a leading edge system that significantly improves operations uh, at our water treatment facility. The $2 million uh, supervisory control and data acquisition, which is the long way of saying SCADA, system addressed the need that was uh, needed upgrade to the Sault Ste. Marie water treatment facilities. And uh, the mayor and I, and I were actually uh, able to, um, to commission that um, for uh, the folks at water treatment. We were able to do a visit and uh, I can tell you that the difference between the two systems was very striking. Um, it literally took us about 25 years into uh, the future from where it had been. Um, but a very, very significant uh, way of providing better oversight, increasing some safety, and improving process control. We also had some very interesting successes in town here with respect to a number of CDM projects, and that's conservation demand management. So it's the way we encourage customers to use less power and the way we bring in subsidies to help them do that. So uh, we were able to, um, in 2018, PUC CDM program reduced energy consumption in our service territory by over 2.3 million kilowatt hours. That's enough to power about 200 homes for the year. So just in terms of some of the savings projects that we were able to bring into town. But one of the real highlights that I wanted to bring to your attention today is the Affordability Fund Trust. We've spoken a couple times with respect to the Affordability Fund Trust. This was a $100 million project that was announced by the provincial government for province-wide expenditures to try to help people who uh, did not qualify for low-income conservation programs, but still needed a little bit of help in terms of affording their bills. Um, out of that $100 million, initially PUC was approved for uh, a little over a million dollars to bring into Sault Ste. Marie. But with the efforts of uh, PUC staff and with some of the successes we've had in getting this adopted, we've gone and recently had that up to eight and a half million dollars. So of the province-wide hundred million dollars, eight and a half million of that's gonna to come to Sault Ste. Marie. And we're well on our target to hit that ahead of time, in which case we may be able, may be able to ask for even more. So it's a huge success. This is a, a program that almost every customer of PUC will qualify for. Uh, there's different levels of qualifying. So depending on income levels, you can get level one, level two, or level three. And as of June, out of, if you think about us having just under 30,000 customers, over 2,000 of them had already been signed up and had been dealt with with respect to the AFT program. So we'd encourage you to get the word out. We'd love to get everybody signed up, uh, and we'd love to get more of that eight, more of that $100 million here in Sault Ste. Marie. So huge success for town. And I'm happy to take any other questions that you might have. Do we have any questions for Mr. Brewer? I don't, Mr. Brewer, because I've, I've been working with you and Andy and everybody for the past uh, year and I want to thank Andy for his leadership on our board and I want to thank you for your good work. I think we've had a good year and I think next year will also be a good year. 
Anything, Council? Seeing none, uh, we've got a number of resolutions we have to pass as the shareholder uh, that the clerk will read. Resolution of the shareholder of PUC Inc. Financial statements, be it resolved that the financial statements of PUC Inc., the corporation, for the fiscal year ended on December 31, 2018, together with the report of the auditors thereon, as placed before the undersigned are hereby approved. Appointment of auditors, be it resolved that the firm of KPMG LLP Chartered Accountants is hereby appointed auditor of the corporation until the close of the next annual meeting of the shareholder or until their successors are duly appointed at a remuneration to be fixed by the directors, the directors being hereby authorized to fix such remuneration. Election of directors, be it resolved that the following persons, each resident Canadians, are hereby elected directors of the corporation to hold office until the close of the third annual meeting of the shareholder following their election or until their successors have been duly elected or appointed, subject to the provisions of the corporation's bylaws and the Ontario Business Corporations Act. Jim Rennie, Carla Fabro, Elaine Pitcher, Andy McPhee. The undersigned being the sole shareholder of the corporation hereby signs each and every one of the foregoing resolutions pursuant to the provisions of the Ontario Business Corporations Act. And this is a resolution of the shareholder of PUC Services, Inc. Financial statements, be it resolved that the financial statements of PUC Services, Inc., the corporation, for the fiscal year ended on December 31, 2018, together with the report of the auditors thereon, as placed before the undersigned, are hereby approved. Appointment of auditors, be it resolved that the firm of KPMG LLP Chartered Accountants is hereby appointed auditor of the corporation until the close of the next annual meeting of the shareholder or until their successors are duly appointed at a remuneration to be fixed by the directors, the directors being hereby authorized to fix such remuneration. Election of directors, be it resolved that the following persons, each resident Canadians, are hereby elected directors of the corporation to hold office until the close of the third annual meeting of the shareholder following their election or until their successors have been duly elected or appointed, subject to the provisions of the corporation's bylaws and the Ontario Business Corporations Act. Jim Rennie, Carla Fabro, Elaine Pitcher, Andy McPhee. The undersigned being the sole shareholder of the corporation hereby signs each and every one of the foregoing resolutions pursuant to the provisions of the Ontario Business Corporations Act. Did it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Do we need to move to get out of the shareholders meeting now, Madam Clerk, or are we just... No, you can just... Okay. So, Council, we're moving on. Uh, before we get into the consent agenda, we're going to pull a bylaw up. Madam Clerk, would you uh, want to read the bylaw, or do you want me to introduce it first? For resolution by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy, resolved that bylaw 2019-141 being a bylaw to appoint Malcolm White as Chief Administrative Officer of the City of Sault Ste. Marie be passed in open council this 17th day of June 2019. Okay, Council, so as you're aware, uh, the CEO Recruitment Committee, which consists of uh, Councillor Hilsing, <coughs> Councillor Nero and I, undertook a recruitment process with the assistance of our Human Resource Department. Uh, we went through substantial process. We had uh, advertised the posting across the country uh, for a month. Uh, we had uh, a number of applicants for the posting. Uh, we took that uh, applicant base and we had a number of discussions and invited a number of people in for interviews. Uh, the end result of the process was that uh, Malcolm White, our current Deputy CEO of Corporate Services, uh, was offered the position and he accepted the position. Uh, the bylaw before you would appoint uh, Mr. White the CAO effective uh, post our July meeting. So Mr. Horseman will maintain, uh, stay with us and be with us until uh, after the July meeting. Uh, for the purposes of the public, I wanted to give you a bit of background about Mr. White. He is uh, known to all of us, but this is some additional germane information that uh, might be helpful. Malcolm attended uh, King George Public School and Sioux Collegiate Institute. After receiving his Bachelor of Physical and Health Education from Laurentian University, he was hired by the city in fall of 1988 in the Recreation and Culture Division as the Recreation Assistant, Sports, Events, and Development. After completing the Municipal Administration Program and gaining further experience, Malcolm was promoted to Deputy City Clerk in January 1996. Malcolm obtained his Certified Municipal Officer designation in 1999, and he was promoted to Deputy Clerk and Manager of Quality Improvement in 2002. Malcolm was promoted to City Clerk in 2010 and then to Deputy CAO City Clerk Corporate Services in 2016 where he has served since. Malcolm's married to wife, uh, his wife Donna. Uh, 
and for 30 years, and they have blessed with two children, Alicia and Matthew. Malcolm would be with us today, but Malcolm's son, Matthew, graduated uh, from his post-secondary education yesterday, and he's, or it's actually today, he's traveling back from there. So I wanna thank uh, Councillor Nero and Councillor Hilsinger for their good work. I wanna just explicitly indicate that I am very confident about this appointment. I have a tremendous amount of uh, faith in and respect for Malcolm's intelligence and his integrity. I think there's two really good things that uh, we can carry from this. Uh, one, it's a great story for our staff. Uh, Malcolm started here uh, in Parks and Recreation in 1988 and moved his way up. And I think we wanna send a very clear message to our staff uh, that we want to develop uh, our staff internally and we want to make sure our staff see opportunity here and see a future here uh, for them at the municipal corporation and i'm also really uh, pleased that uh, we have somebody that's going to be uh, internally staying with us and, and moving on to a more significant role uh, to make sure that we can continue doing some of the great work that we've been doing together uh, we've had a lot of momentum over the last number of years. Uh, I thank Al for his contributions to that. Al will be with us uh, at our July 16th uh, meeting, so we won't be uh, saying goodbye to him tonight. Uh, we'll save that for uh, July. But uh, I want to thank him for that good work, and it's positive that we can continue that on and we could uh, not lose any momentum as we try and uh, help our community move forward in a positive and productive way. So I, I think this is uh, a really great day for us. I think it'll be... Uh, really solid for our term and it will be uh, it'll be really great for staff so uh, I'm happy to take any comments or answer any questions Councilor Dufour thank you mr. mayor I'd just like to offer my congratulations to city clerk Malcolm White um, in my short term on council um, he's uh, been an excellent resource and I've known him to be uh, just a, a man of integrity and a man of the process, and I think that uh, that means very good things for our city going forward. So thank you, Malcolm, and congratulations. Okay, so we'll vote in the bylaw. All in favor? Carried. Is there anything else you require with that, Madam Clerk? No, I'm just closing the vote. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hilsinger, I'm going to ask you uh, if you could please take my place. To consent. Actually, before you get into consent, yes, sir. You can, as the acting mayor, declare we have north. Oh my goodness! Well, how much fun can you have? Um, so I can just sort of do this off the cuff, off the fly. You can make a proclamation. Uh, okay, as as acting mayor, uh, I, I have my pleasure to make a proclamation that I believe was suggested. I want to say by Councillor Scott. Am I right about that, Councillor Scott? Might have been. Might have been. Might have been. Uh, so we thought uh, that in light of all the wonderful things uh, going in, on in Toronto today and the great uh, celebration that's happening uh, with the Toronto Raptors, uh, the, the, uh, the team that has accomplished what they, uh, for the first time, uh, the world champion uh, NBA team, that uh, we should be proud in Sault Ste. Marie, as many, many other Canadians are, and declare this, while a little bit late in the day, still... It's five after five. This is We the North Day. So that's a proclamation. Do I need to do anything else? Other? Yeah, there we go. No one objects to that, do they? <laughs> All right, fantastic. That's a crazy scene down there today. Okay, uh, moving on to consent. Um, Marshy? Okay, do you get to do that first? Yes? 6.3, 6.8, and 6.9 I'd like pulled from consent. Okay, uh, any other items to pull from consent at this time? Any other items with questions, Marshy? Did you have questions on anything other than those three? I had 6.3. Okay. Um, 6.4. Okay. 6.3 and 6.4 are both accepted from consent. Okay, they're ex okay. Um, no, 6.4. No, no, um, Mr. Turcos, active, uh, sorry, 6.14. Okay. 
the act of transportation. Yes. Uh, just to follow up, anything on Pine Street, have you discussed it with the neighbors? I thought there was supposed to be a meeting that was supposed to be held. Mr. Turco's microphone. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Mayor. Uh, there is a public open house scheduled this Thursday. Uh, it's being hosted at Algoma Public Health. Um, notice of the open house did go out to all the neighbors uh, and residents that live on Willow and Pine Street. So they all received a notice of that, of that open house. Is that all your questions? Anyone else with questions on 6. Uh, an officer just to Mr. Girardi uh, has the individual started sir yes the individual has started he's in training completing training and uh, uh, getting out in the field working side by side with the uh, existing bylaw officer okay thank you any other questions on 6.15 any other questions on 6.14 any other questions on anything Mr. Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. 6.2, Port of Al or the former Port of Algoma, what's now known as the Algoma Docks Project. Yes. Through you to uh, Mr. Uh, Horseman. Um, there's a reference in here to requiring an extension to ensure that the NOHFC and FEDMAR funding remains available. Have we had confirmation from those parties that uh, the funding will remain available? Uh, through you, Ms. Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, that's part of what we want to have the discussion, discussions with them to make sure that we can get that extended. There seems to be an appetite, but we need to come to Council to make sure there's an appetite on behalf of Council as well. So all we're seeking is uh, the opportunity to go and speak with those partners and get it extended to December 31st as we work through the process with the new owners that came out of the CCAA process to be able to uh, uh, see if the project's still scoped the same way and that there's going to be the continued funding that we expect. And um, have you had those initial discussions with the new owners of Algoma or with the new management at Algoma? Uh, through you, Mas Madam Acting Mayor, to uh, Councillor Schumacher, we've begun those conversations uh, with the, uh, the new CEO as well as with the uh, management team. So we've made those outreaches. And are they looking favorable or is it uh, too early to tell? Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, there's, there's been positive dialogue, but it's very early in the process with the, with the new owners. Um, from a city perspective, uh, council and, and staff, what can we do to ensure that this remains a, a corporate priority for us as, as an economic development or an economic diversification strategy? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councilor Shoemaker, we've already put together a team, established a team that we're going to have working with the various partners, and in particular with the Algoma team, to be able to make sure that that's brought forward. There's also a task force and other groups that feed uh, into this, uh, one of them being the Transportation Infrastructure Task Force that is sponsor, uh, sponsors to the CAO office to be able to give advice for how this could best be brought forward. And who's our internal team? Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, uh, uh, Mr. Vare, uh, Deputy CAO for Community Development and Enterprise Services, uh, Mr. Dan Hollingsworth, uh, Executive Director for the Economic Development Corporation. We have yet to uh, reach out to Innovation Centers to see if, what they might have in terms of appetite. And then the support groups that uh, work with them. In terms of the actual project work, our internal uh, people include the City Engineer and the Deputy CAO of uh, Public Works and Engineering. Okay. I mean, this is, uh, in my view, still a, a significant priority for us that we should be pursuing. So I, I'd like, uh, I'd like obviously to see this passed, but I'd also like council to be kept uh, abreast of what's uh, what developments occur. Uh, through you, Madam Act Mayor, we'll make sure there's regular updates to 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 council, whether through emails and or through reports as we go uh, work through the process. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on six point two? Councillor Gardy, you had something? 6.6, 6, please. Okay. Um, the, uh, through you, acting, Madam Acting Mayor, to Mrs. Shell on 6.6, 6, the RFP for the uni Unified Communication System. Um, 
in the report, Ms. Shell, it uh, outlined some annual savings that we could anticipate under the new contract as compared to the existing one. Would you be able to elaborate on that a bit, please? Shells. Oh, she! I didn't even turn around. I'm sorry. Uh, My apologies. Microphone. I thought you had, you, you had left. No, no. <laughs> Through Madam Acting Mayor to Councillor Gardy. Um, yes, originally in the 2019 budget, if you recall, staff estimated a savings of about $75,000, half of it for 2019 of 37.5. Our annual operating savings on this new contract, if approved, is $140,000 a year. So that'll be an additional $102,500 for the 2020 budget. Perfect, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Mayor. Through you uh, to uh, the manager of IT, with uh, this um, report, staff had expected to spend in the range of 600000 uh, What's actually being spent is, I think, about 150000 So are we sure that... Um, that everything that we need upgraded uh, is being upgraded in, in this response to RFP? Like they're not, they haven't so significantly undercut the price that they're gonna come back and say, oh, well, we missed this in response to our, uh, in response to our RFP. Oh, good. Uh, through you, um, Acting uh, Madam Mayor. Um, we made it very clear in the RFP and during our site inspections, the current state of our infrastructure, both from a wiring perspective and a networking perspective. And uh, the Shaw has clearly indicated uh, how they are going to address uh, that uh, deficiency. And it's through um, uh, cabling that they'll be doing as well as uh, introducing new uh, networking uh, infrastructure as well. So I'm, I'm confident that they've, they've made provisions for that in, in the response that they uh, put forward. So put, put another way, you'd be confident that there won't be a, a return to the council agenda to say this was missed in the response to the RFP and we need to increase the, the spend? Uh, through you, uh, Acting Madam Mayor, uh, yes, that's correct. I don't believe we'll get anything coming back to us for additional dollars. Okay, thank you. And through uh, you, Madam Acting Mayor, to the Commissioner of Finance um, or the uh, Treasurer, um, with respect to the uh, capital expenditures from uh, last year's budget, this was one of them. We budgeted 600000 for it. Obviously, it's come in significantly under price, which is great news. Um, and that was debt financed. So what do we now... Uh, do do we not draw on a line of credit or do we pay back an amount that we had previously drawn on? How does it work? To you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, if you recall from the 2019 budget, at the time we approved some capital projects uh, and we were going to fund them internally. Um, we did have a surplus in 2018, which was able to cover off those items. So there is no debt financing for this project. It is a capital from current allocation that we're using and by doing this the excess money will just be put back into next year's budget for the usual forward draw. So the the difference between what we budgeted for and the um, and the uh, what what the actual return uh, price is is going to be surplus next year if there is a surplus. It, it's not surplus in the operating budget it'll be rolled forward into our capital. Gotcha okay. Okay. Those are my questions on that item. Anyone else on 6.6? .6? Anyone on anything other than the three items that are pulled? Councillor Dufour? For Councillor I believe Councillor Shoemaker pulled 6.3 earlier. Yes, but pulled is 6.3, 6.8, and 6.9. And 6.4 as well. Okay. And 6.4 as well. Okay, so I just, I didn't know if he should go first on it, but I, I just had wanted my name on the list for 6.3 as well. Okay. I had one more on okay. 6.7, if we get a chance. I had a question. For comments or questions. I had a question on 6.7. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, through you, uh, Madam Acting Mayor, to, um, I'm going to put this to Mr. Vare. Um, Mr. Vare, um, in regards to the recommendation that came out of the RFP for on-demand transit, uh, the on-demand transit technology system, 
Um, in the in appendix, it, you, you're, you're recommending that we go with via mobility. Uh, appendix A provides us with some information on via mobility. It talks about some partnerships that uh, VIA has internationally with a number of, uh, in dozens of cities across a number of countries. Um, I was just wondering if they have any current partnerships that you're aware of in Ontario or Canada. Would you know that at all? True, you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Gardy. Um, they do have a, a partnership with a, a city in Quebec, um, and um, that's the only other Canadian city. Um, and then, as you mentioned, uh, they have a number of contracts uh, worldwide. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Scott, you have a question on 6.7. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to, I suppose, Mr. Baer. Um, question about the application. So the appendix kind of doesn't get deep into this, but is there a, a, like a non-app option to hail one of these buses, per se? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Scott, yes, there will be an option that people can call in to a, a dispatcher and, uh, you know, uh, log their request. And that'll work basically the same way? There's no different pricing or anything along those lines? Correct. Good. And is there, just out of curiosity, is there a, a web-based one as well? So beyond the app, um, let's say somebody still has a BlackBerry or something, would they be able to use a, a website to do the same? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to uh, Councillor Scott, I believe the only two ways right now are the app and the direct telephone. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on 6.7 or any other items other than the four that are pulled? If not, we will move on to 6.3, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank I'm going to open I'm the, I'm going to open I'm the consent agenda to vote. Resolved that all items listed under date June 17, 2019, agenda item 6, consent agenda be approved as recommended, save and accept agenda items 6.3, 6.4, 6.8, and 6.9. All in favor? My voting isn't working, FYI. Okay, I'll do it for you. Okay, so we can proceed. On 6.3, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, uh, Madam shall I, read the, shall I read the motion first? Yeah, sure. A motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy resolved that the report of the Chief Administrative Officer dated June 17, 2019 regarding audit and accountability fund be received and that an expression of interest to access the audit and accountability fund be provided to the province, further that the increased scope of work be single sourced to KPMG LLP to be fully funded through the audit and accountability fund. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to the CAO. Mr. CAO, I, my recollection is we asked at budget time if K, the KPMG report was going to identify line item costs for specific programs so council would have an easier time identifying what the priorities were uh, and we were told at the time I believe that that wasn't the purpose of the uh, the MRM as it's called in the, in the report. Um, but the purpose it seems to me of the province's uh, audit is exactly that, to identify line item expenses uh, that the city may not consider priorities. So if that's not the purpose of the MRM, but that is the purpose of the audit uh, that the province is encouraging us to get, why would we sole source it to KPMG, who's doing the first project, when, when that's, that's not their intention? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, we're still unclear, as it's indicated in the report, as to what is intended with the audit and accountability fund that's been described. Uh, staff have not been able to give us some clear uh, indication at the provincial level as to what is being looked for. We're taking it to mean uh, it, it's more of a service efficiency, service review type of exercise, which is what we've already undertaken through the municipal reference model that the council supported. Uh, in terms of its initial phases. All we're saying is we intend this to continue to just be a continuation in, or acceleration of what we, the work that's already started through that municipal reference model process, which is why we're saying single source. We've indicated to the pro provincial administration officials that that's our understanding of it, and when we go forward with an expression of interest, if that's the will of council, we'll reiterate that again. We're not necessarily seeing it as a line by line uh, audit, notwithstanding some of the differing opinions uh, expressed through various media outlets, 
Uh, instead, we're looking at it as, as an exercise of looking at a service review, which we were going to ultimately do anyways as part of this exercise. Uh, so it just would be an acceleration. That's the rationale between. Uh, okay. Um, perhaps it's the vague interpretation or the vague guidelines given out by the province that's the issue, but my reading of, of everything I've read on, on this audit fund is that they want municipalities to save money. So um, if, if KPMG's service review or M MRM, as you call it in the report, municipal reference model, municipal reference model uh, is not going to identify dollar amounts, then how does that benefit us in, in, in finding savings? Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, through uh, to Councillor Shoemaker again, it's identifying where there might be some efficiencies. There may be some dollar uh, <laughs> reductions associated with that, but it's looking at the actual services that are being rendered, looking at whether or not they're necessary, looking at whether or not we can, uh, is there d different ways that you can deliver those services. So that's the process that we see it undertaking. There could be savings that uh, accrue because of that. That's why we undertook the exercise in the first place. But it could be that there's, it's found that there's no savings that could be identified out of that. And that's again why we were looking for clarity from the province. I use as an example through you, Acting Mayor, in Toronto, they went through a service review exercise uh, a few years back. And as a result of that, there was an increase to the tax levy of 2.5% because they realized that some of the services that they were rendering is, uh, were below the standards that were necessary for, the, uh, uh, for municipal standards and best practices. We're not expecting that here, but we don't know. We just want to go through the exercise. And if it is that we're able to be, uh, get funding from the province to be able to help us to go and do that work, we'd like to do so. But we're looking to the province to uh, confirm that that's what they want out of it when we provide the expression of interest. Um, so everything uh, up to the semicolon in the, in the resolved uh, motion is I agree to, but uh, uh, I, I guess I would move to not single source it to KPMG. I think it's, it's, it's incumbent on us to have the province pay for, pay for an audit. That would be great because they're not, uh, very willing uh, partners in other regards. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we should take them up on their offer to, to pay for an audit. I, I don't think we should single source it. If KPMG's municipal uh, review uh, manual or whatever you call that, I'm sorry, I can't remember the acronym, um, is, is going to help uh, the ultimate work that, that comes out of this uh, provincial audit, their price will reflect that. And so uh, I, I don't see why we would single source it to them if, if they're gonna come back with a better price to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, given, given that they're already working on some other stuff. So that, that's, I would move to, to amend this to remove the second further uh, from this motion if, if anybody wishes to second that. Does anybody wish to second that? Councillor Scott? So now what happened? Um. Do we finish the questions first? Um, no, we'll do the, um, can you tell me the words that you want in your amendment? Yes, everything from <laughs> resolved at the report up to audit and accountability fund be provided to the province. And then everything else is removed. Just so it. you're asking that the word further, from further that the increased? Yes, this. So you're asking that that second paragraph be deleted? That's right. And it's uh, Councillor Scott. Scott is seconding that? Yes. So I've opened that to the vote. So, Councillor Dufour, sorry. I just had a few questions for the CAO that would probably significantly influence my vote, but I don't know if I'm procedurally, am I allowed to ask those mm -hmm. at this time? Okay. 
Go ahead. Before we vote on Councillor Shoemaker's amendment. You, you wanted to ask about the <laughs> amendment? Or? No, I wanted to ask about the report. I still have questions about the report. He still has initial questions re regardless of the change in the uh, motion. If you're going to have the questions regardless, then we can vote on the amendment so that we know what the main motion is. So his comments are that he feels that his decision in voting for the, uh, the changed motion would be um, affected by the, asking okay. the questions he liked, he'd like to ask. So go ahead. So, okay. Okay. Um, so, um, for you, Madam Acting Mayor, to CA Horseman, um, it was, um, I, I had emailed you a question earlier. It was my understanding um, that the province had already procured some of the services of KPMG for this audit and accountability fund. Is that correct or am I mistaken? Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, we were not able to confirm that that's what they've done. So they've indicated instead in terms of their releases that there's an audit and uh, accountability fund that's open to the tune of $7.5 million. Okay, so our other municipalities required to hire their own firms to to complete the audit then? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Council Dufour, as indicated previously, we're having we're not getting clarity from the province in terms of what exactly the uh, the exercise is to be or what okay. the specifics or the mechanics are. So what instead we were told we would should put in an expression of interest. So our intent was to put in an expression of interest and outline what we're expecting mm -hmm. that this is gonna be utilized for. Okay, and, and would there be an opportunity for the province to comment after our expression of interest to give further clarity as to whether or not our sole sourcing of KPMG fits within the parameters of their fund? Uh, certainly that's within their purview. Uh, again, we, we don't have any details as to what it is that they're looking for in terms of this audit and account affordability fund, save and accept mm -hmm. what's been through the announcements. Okay, and would the expectation be after the expression of interest has been received and communication has come back from the province that it, the administration here in Sault Ste. Marie would then come back to council with that information? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, that is correct. Okay, and at that time, would we not have an opportunity to decide whether or not we wanted to sole source the contract to KPMG to continue our municipal reference model or take a different avenue at that point? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, if it is a different avenue than what staff has interpreted, yes. Yes, and wouldn't we have much more information from the province at that future point in order to make it this decision? Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, that uh, would be a, a, our hope, but there's a deadline date, as you see in the materials as well, that they've provided, which is June, for us to make to provide an expression of interest. So it's caused us some... Uh, yes, so we can express our interest now. Exactly. Receive communication from the province, and then decide on exactly which avenue we decide to take once the province has clarified their position. Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, uh, given w what we've been told to date, uh, I think that's a reasonable approach. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bruni, did you want to ask your question before we vote? Yes. I still don't know what we're going to vote on with Councillor Shoemaker's uh, uh, change in the resolution, but I, I just a couple of questions to Mr. Horseman. You said you don't know exactly what the government is looking for. In the provincial report that I read, there was three lines that they wanted. It was a line-by-line -line audit. They want a value-for-money audit, and obviously they want to find savings up to 4%. So why would you think that the government would say, yes, we're okay to go with KPMG and we're going to provide you the funding for it? They already have a set mandate what, what, what money they want to provide to each municipality. Am I correct? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, the issue is definitions in terms of what is the value for money that they're looking for. So what do they mean by the value for money audit that they want to undertake? What do they mean by the line-by-line -line, uh, audit that they want to undertake? What is, uh, 
there's qualification qualifiers that have been put in there. For example, no revenue stream is being allowed to be considered in terms of the materials that we've seen. Mm -hmm. So we want to understand why not, or you know, how does that play into the equation? There's no, uh, there's a, a clear signal in some of the materials that have been provided that it is not to impact any frontline services. So we need to identify what what is meant by the frontline services, which is what the re municipal reference model was was going to be undertaking. So those are the types of uh, challenges that we're finding in terms of putting putting this together. So has any discussion occurred with Ross Romano? I mean, he was in Sudbury making the announcement there. Sudbury was interested uh, in, in it. I mean, have we reached out to Mr. Romano regarding the, the clarification that's needed? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, we've reached out to our administration uh, counterparts and asked for that clarification they were unable to provide. So you didn't reach out to Romano? Through you, Madam uh, Acting Mayor, we did not reach out directly to, uh, uh, to the MPP's uh, office regarding this. So I guess my concern is the government is offering an independent auditor to come and audit. Instead of us paying for a consultant, like we normally do for many consultants, there's a, a free service that the government's providing. Why aren't we even like moving forward uh, with it? Uh, I just, we're trying to skirt around and try to get the money to piggyback what on KPMG right now. Am I correct? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, uh, again, if that funding's available and it's a, an extension of the work that's already being done by KPMG through the municipal reference model process, then we've, we as staff felt that that's the appropriate uh, avenue to pursue. But we needed to get clarity as to what, uh, how that would occur. In the meantime, we have the, a very hard deadline in terms of a submission that had to be made. So we're uh, uh, looking for the, to provide that expression of interest and then see what comes back from the province in terms of uh, uh, being able to fund what we're looking to do. I'll be which we think is going to come back and agree with you that they're going to provide the funding as you're requesting it. Um, I, no, I won't ask that question because I put you on the spot. Like there's other municipalities that have shown strong interest or have already signed up. For instance, Kitchener uh, Regional Council and Sudbury is showing serious interest. Um, any other municipalities do you know of? Uh, uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, there are some, and there's also some that have already indicated they will not be yes, participating I'm aware of that. in it. Yeah. For example, Ottawa and Guelph. Mm -hmm. Toronto is still going through its exercise as to whether, mm -hmm. whether they're going to or not. If you receive this money to continue with KPMG, when will this project be completed? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, uh, as was identified for the MR, uh, M project initially, we want to have something that's going to inform the 2020 budget. 2020. Will KPMG do a line by line uh, audit? Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni. It's not a line by line the way that uh, it's been thought of before. It's, it's again, it's a review of to what are the services that are necessary, what's the profile of services that you're uh, providing, and how is it that you could maybe do it more, uh, provide those services more efficiently. Would it be looking at duplication? Would it be looking at duplication work if there's through you, Madam Acting Mayor, yes, if that's, uh, to Councillor Bruni, yes, if that's uh, one of the things that's identified, uh, certainly that would be brought up. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. So we have other questions. Councillor Gardy? Well, I, I had some questions, but I'm thoroughly confused now. I'll be very honest with you, and I think that's what, well, I'm struggling with, and maybe a couple other people around the table. There isn't any much clarity around what the province's, province wants. Um, I kind of uh, like where Councillor Dufour was going in his line of questioning um, in that. Could, could we just express the interest and then make the decision on how we would pursue it subsequent to that? Ma ma through you, Adam McNamara, to, to uh, CAO Horseman. 
Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, uh, again, if that's Council's will, we could we could provide that in, uh, expression of interest. We were looking at a dollar value, and we wanted to put some sort of uh, gotcha. frame around it so as to be able to have them say no, and this is why. But we could just say it's an expression of interest, and here's what we, we're planning to do with the funding. Are we eligible or not? Yeah, understood. Um, you know. This is the frustration, right? The municipalities are having all over this province and dealing with this provincial government where they put things out there without any explanation and people have to ask these questions and um, you have to do things in the dark. So uh, I uh, sympathize with you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. Um, I, express, I understand the confusion um, that, that is being expressed, but in my mind, I think that it's... It is exactly what it is. I mean, it's vague, sure, but the, the intent is to save money. We know that. Um, I did find something that the city of Hamilton pr provided um, at one of their council meetings from Deputy Minister Laurie LeBlanc, I think it was, which has the criteria, the eligibility criteria, and it does state uh, line by line review of the entire budget, a review of service delivery and modernization opportunities, a review of administrative processes to reduce costs. It has to result in a final report that has to be publicly posted by November 30th, 2019. And in the same thing that came from the minister, it also mentions that they expect most projects to be less than $250,000. So the reason that I would second Councillor Shoemaker's motion is because if they're gonna give us the money, provided we follow the rules, um, we should absolutely put it out for, for a public bid. Um, if KPMG gets it, so be it. But. The opportunity is there, and even if there is overlap of work, I don't think that necessarily matters. We've already earmarked the money for the one project for, for KPMG that they're doing. So regardless of how it gets done, I think we take the opportunity. They're, they're going to give us money to do it. If we find the savings, that's excellent, especially because if they're saying four cents on every dollar, maybe they'll just take that right out of the money that we get from the province next year, regardless of whether or not we find the savings. And we may rely on this next year at budget time. So. Those are kind of my thoughts. Um, I don't have any questions, because to me, I think what they're pitching is pretty straightforward, uh, even though it's vague, if that makes sense. And um, I just wanted to kind of give my thoughts on why I would second that motion. Thank you. Councillor Nero. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. I, I, I'm just, uh, maybe if you can have the city clerk read the amended motion so I'm okay. clear on what we're talking about. And you may have a, are we going to vote now or, or you want to reserve time for a Well, I'd like to hear it before question. I vote. Okay. I have it in front of me, but I wasn't prepared to vote because I'm not, okay. not sure what we amended here. Okay, so the amendment is to take out the second paragraph, which would leave the motion at resolve that the report of the Chief Administrative Officer dated June 17, 2019 regarding audit and accountability fund be received and that an expression of interest to access the audit and accountability fund be provided to the province. Okay, and may I follow that with a question maybe to uh, Mr. Horseman. I guess I, taking the words from your report, I guess, we go through this exercise and we get the money from the province to do the line-by-line -line audit or however it's going to get done. We don't have any guarantees that once the final report comes back or comes out, we report the savings to the province, there are no guarantees that they're going to take that number and just reduce our boom fund from that. So it's not as if we're going to find some savings and be able to say, you know what, we just found some savings of $2 million, let's put it towards roads. We're not going to, we may not have that uh, choice in the matter. Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, that is correct. That's the, the, the and as I indicated in the report, that's one of the things that we, we really do need to have some clarity around as well as, as the definitions of what is meant by a line by line audit, of what is meant by a value for money, et cetera, clarity around that 4%. Uh, it, it's clearly states and it was highlighted in the one news release that's been attached to this report that the uh, intention is the shared or joint uh, interest in, of uh, dealing with the provincial fiscal imbalance. So it's unclear as to what that really entails. Is it that the OMPF might be uh, reduced by a, a like amount? W we would say it shouldn't be. It's, it's an exercise that should be for the municipalities, but we need that to be. But in reality, that's the only way we can share in helping to reduce the province's debt is by reducing their 
grant to us, to municipalities. And through you, Madam Acting Mayor, that is correct. But again, that's why we wanted clarity that if we're going to go through this exercise, where if there are savings that come out of it, where does it go? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more questions, can we, do we need to write, read the resolution again or is everyone clear? Right now you're voting on the amendment Amended. to yeah. remove that second okay. paragraph. Okay. So we're good? Uh, it's open for vote. All in favor? That's, Just can't tell. You. That carries 5-2. That carries. Okay. Moving on to 6 point. No, no, oh, we no. will. Catch up. So now the, the main motion is before you. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yes. Receiving the report and to express interest to access the audit and accountability fund to be provided to the province. And that's open for voting. So all in favor? I'll vote in favor. favor. That motion carries. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now moving on to 6.4. Yeah. Did you want to read the... I will read the motion for 6.4. That's a motion by Councillors Dufour and Scott. Resolved that the report of the Manager of Audits and Capital Planning dated June 17, 2019 concerning 2018 audited financial statements be received and that the audited consolidated financial statements and trust fund statements for 2018 be approved. Councillor Shoemaker? No. Who, uh, then who pulled 6.4? Um, it was pulled just because of Councillor Hollingsworth's conflict. Oh, all right. So... I'll open it to vote then. We'll open that to vote. All in favor? And that's carried. All in favor. Okay. Councillor Bruni, you vote in favor? Okay. And then okay. we're moving so we're to 6.8. 6 a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy resolved that the report of the manager of purchasing dated June 17, 2019 regarding RFP Professional Services Asset Management Assessment 2019 be received and the proposal submitted by Morrison Hirschfield Limited for the Asset Management Assessment 2019 update for the City of Sault Ste. Marie be approved on a single source basis. Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. I pulled this one because it was a recommendation to single source as well. Uh, through you to uh, Ms. Shell, probably, because I don't see Mr. Gowans here. If um, Morrison Hirschfield is the company that prepared the initial asset management plan, wouldn't their price to update the asset management plan reflect, if this went to an RFP, the fact that they've already got some advanced knowledge uh, of, of what the asset management plan says? To you, Ms. Uh, through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, um, technically, yes, it probably should reflect that, uh, but we've already put this out for RFP, and like other contracts, there is an extension available in it um, that we're asking Council to take advantage of at, for this one last update. Okay, um, but but I guess if if we went to RFP, you're you're. I guess what you're un underlying what you're saying is that their price would probably come back the lowest one. To you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, that is the assumption that uh, staff is making through the procurement. Uh, we expect that it will be higher or equal to what we paid Morsh and Hirschfield uh, when they did the original review because whoever comes in now is going to have to basically do a more thorough uh, review of the, all the different buildings. Again, yes, but again, an RFP would would suss that out. 
if we take the time to do it, yes. I, I would ask maybe um, um, that Don Elliott, uh, Director of Engineering, may have some comments. He's more familiar with the engineering side than I would be. Madam McNamara, I wasn't uh, following completely there, but I, I can say that I think it's appropriate here to go with the same firm. They've been through all of the buildings, and as part of the original RFP, there was a, a price provided to review it later. It is less than we expect it would be if we hired another firm. And instead of putting the industry through the cost of proposals again for something like this, I think it's appropriate to uh, just retain Morris and Hirschfield for this second round. Okay, but instead of, I mean, you're, you're looking at it from the industry perspective of instead of having them bid on it, you're saying, uh, from a taxpayer's perspective, what I'm looking at it from is from a taxpayer's perspective, don't we want to get them the best price? What if what if someone came in and said uh, that they were willing to review all the old documents, you know, for free and, and conduct the update uh, on, a, on a lesser fee? Mad Acting Mayor uh, to Councilor Shoemaker, I, I think it's wise to... Uh, I don't necessarily think it's wise in every situation to take the lowest price, frankly. In this situation, uh, I think the best thing to do is to stay with the same consultant. They're familiar with all the buildings. They've been through them before. And uh, it's just not one of those situations where it's worth starting over again. But from, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but the starting over, what you're building into the report, or what the report says, I realize you, you aren't the one that drafted it, but what's built into it is someone's going to have to review the previous work of Morris and Hirschfield, so their price is necessarily going to be higher. That's the assumption built into this report, right? That's correct, and the it's the familiarity with all of the buildings themselves. Their staff went through all of the buildings. It's likely the same staff that are going through and looking at the same things that they saw before and updating what they see. Right, but from the perspective of an updated report, these, these have to be updated every five years, as I understand, is that correct? That's correct, and I believe that's why, Madam Acting Mayor to Councilor Shoemaker, I believe that's why uh, the Finance Department likely put that clause in there, is give us a price five years out to look at everything you looked at a second time. Right, but then if we're if we're working off of your previous statement that it's the same staff and the same um, uh, folks going through the buildings because they have familiarity with them, wouldn't aren't you basically suggesting that five years again they're going to be the best one? Five years after that they'll be the best one. We'll never put it out to tender. Madam Acting Mayor to Councilor Schumacher, that may be the choice at that time. I think it's appropriate. It's a ten-year cycle that you're, you're essentially here. Uh, the original. It's going to be 10 years from the first time, so the staff may be different. It may be appropriate to, to, re, uh, to, to do an RFP again because of, of the passage of time. This is not unlike the biennial bridge inspections and aqueduct inspections. It's generally a good idea to have the same professional look at what they were looking at before rather than starting from square one. I, I Just reiterating, I don't believe that it's in, it's in best interest of the taxpayer to go with the lowest price when you're hiring professional services, whether it's engineering, accounting, or legal. That's, that's my opinion. But, and I, and I understand that we've had that debate on a number of uh, occasions. Um, what, we're, what we would get back in an RFP is a scope of work, and, and a, a committee would evaluate whether or not those proposals were sufficient and, and the expertise of the folks doing them, would, would it not? So, I mean, you're, the assumptions you're making in your response are, I think, two steps out, and, and you're missing the question I'm asking, which is only one step out. <laughs> the RFP Evaluation Committee would determine whether or not the, the firm that responds to an RFP, if there was one, had the expertise available to it to, to do this update, would it not? Madam Acting Mayor to Councilor Schumer, that's correct. The, the committee would... Uh, it's likely that a vendor of record list in any event, and those vendors are already qualified to review this, to do this kind of project. Right. So your concern about them not having the qualifications is somewhat a moot point, is it not? 
Madam Acting Mayor, it's not my concern for their qualifications. It's more a recommendation based on their familiarity with the facilities from the last review. So do we know if the person that's doing the update would be the same person, the very same individual as the one that did the initial report? Madam, Madam Acting Mayor to Councilor Shoemaker, I believe it's the same individual. If my memory is accurate, I've been copied some of the emails on the negotiations with Martian Hirschfield, and I, yes, I believe it's the same individual. Um, just for clarity, what negotiations are those? Because I thought they had responded with this price in a previous RFP. Madam Acting Mayor to uh, Councilor Shoemaker, I believe I saw some emails confirming what their price was going to be based on uh, the original RFP and probably the consumer price index or however you acknowledge uh, inflation. Okay, well, I, I think I've, I've asked enough questions. I obviously don't feel comfortable going to them on a sole source basis. I think that uh, if they uh, are going to be the greatest expertise for the best price, their, their response to RFP will reflect that. Okay. Councillor Gardy. Thank you. Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Mr. Elliott. Mr. Elliott, is it your opinion that RFPs should always be sole sourced? Madam Acting Mayor to Councilor Gardy, no. Thank you. Thank you. It's not. I didn't think it was. Um, is it fair to say that in summary, this report reflects sole sourcing because of the continuity and consistency from five years prior to the, to the inspections that would take place this time around with the company that would do it? Madam Acting Mayor to Councilor Gardy, yes. Uh, one of the, I'd like to clarify one thing. I believe we are single sourcing in this yeah. case. As Sorry, opposed to sole forgive, sourcing. The, forgive the verbiage. Yeah, this is, we're single sourcing I, to one firm. There are other firms that are qualified to I do appreciate it. The, the, I appreciate the clarification. So I'm gonna ask my question again. Do you believe that RFP should always be single sourced? Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, no, we, we uh, when you submit or when you issue an RFP, uh -huh. you're re doing a request for proposal from yep. multiple firms. Right. So no, if you're if you're issuing an RFP, that's not single sourcing. Right. In this case. In this so case, here's he, what I'm getting at, Mr. Elliott. I don't, you know, Mr. Shoemaker brings this up every time. It's there's there's an issue like this, and I don't know if you would have been able to answer any of his questions sufficiently. So I'm glad he stopped at seven or eight. Um, I won't be, I won't be, uh, I won't be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, did you? I'm opening it. Want to open that for voting? Yep. Councillor Gardy? No, oh. You have to vote. <laughs> I'll I'm do it glad for you. You're good. Glad the affirmative? In the past, it has. Yeah, I can see that your, your icon isn't there anymore. Do you vote yes or no? I vote for it. Motion carries. Okay. So we'll move on to the last uh, from consent 6.9. A motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Scott resolved that the report of the manager of purchasing dated June 17, 2019 regarding RFQ traffic control equipment Bay Street improvements be received the supply and delivery of traffic control equipment for installation on Bay Street at a quoted price of $154,681.95 plus HST by Econolite Canada of Markham, Ontario be approved on a sole source basis. Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. Uh, through you, I think to Mr. Girardi, um, at the bottom of the first page of the report, 
uh, you note that uh, there is an absence of competition uh, in, uh, in this field, but then at the top of the second page, you note there will be other significant procurement, procurements of certain traffic control equipment that can be single sourced uh, through competitive, or sorry, that can be sourced through competitive bidding. So I'm, I'm confused with respect to the request to sole source it, when in one instance you're saying absence of competition means we have to sole source it here, and in the other instance you're saying other equipment uh, can be competitively uh, sourced. So, so. Through so Acting Mayor Councillor Shoemaker, Public Works is requesting sole sourcing of the equipment from Econolite on the basis of the standardization of this particular equipment as a paramount consideration in order to ensure safe tra traffic control system, which is standardized within our traffic equipment. There are other por portions to that, uh, like um, the astral brackets, and I'm not familiar with all the other technical terms of the equipment. There are components that can be purchased that are not necessarily so uh, synchronized with our existing system. All those will be, uh, of course, uh, tendered out. So just the specific stuff to the control boxes so it stays standard to the equipment that we already have and the equipment that the, the guys are trained on and confident with. And of course, it econolites the, the actual provider of that equipment. So there's two components. One has to synchronize, the other one are just components that don't necessarily have to synchronize to the system, so they're going to go out for tender. Okay. Um, and what's, I, I guess, what's the importance of it being standardized? Uh, I guess it is, it's all very technical equipment, so and it has to marry up to the existing system that we already have in place. So to try and put something different in there, well, then, from what I'm understanding, this is the company that produces that type of equipment. So anything that doesn't have to marry up to the existing system is going to go out for tender. And is this a supply direct from the manufacturer or is it? Yes, that? it is. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Those are my questions. Okay. Anyone else with questions on 6.9? Uh, seeing none, we will go ahead and vote. Now we're down to eight, right? Okay, under agenda item 8.1, a motion by Councillors Dufour and Scott, whereas the collective missions of the Innovation Centre, the Sault Ste. Marie Economic Development Corporation, and Future Sault Ste. Marie all include attracting new business to our community. <coughs> And whereas the modern workforce is changing in terms of corporations allowing flexible and remote work agreements, especially in knowledge-based industry, and whereas findings from a 2017 global survey of over 24,000 workers by Polycom Inc. reported the vast majority of respondents, 98%, agree that an anywhere working approach boosts a productivity as people can choose to work where they are most efficient. And whereas the survey also revealed that 62% of the global working population is working flexibly more than ever before and whereas there are over 400,000 people working in the technology industry in Toronto and there are 1,800 technology-based companies located in Toronto and whereas growing our business community helps grow a healthy community, now therefore be it resolved that the City requests that the Innovation Centre, the Sault Ste. Marie Economic Development Corporation and Future Sault Ste. Marie set up a task force to develop a targeted recruitment plan to attract and retain remote workers in the knowledge-based industry from the Greater Toronto Area to locate to our community. Okay, questions? Yes, I'm so sorry. Councillor Dufour, would you care to speak to that motion? <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Acting Mayor. I would, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge um, for all the public that uh, though I do wholeheartedly support this motion, I'm uh, moving it and speaking it um, on behalf of my War II counterpart, Lisa Vezo Allen, who uh, can't be here due to a family emergency today. Um, what this task force is uh, designed to target is uh, not just the people employed in the GTA in tech companies, but specifically the remote workers who are living and working in the GTA, but working remotely for other areas. Um, we've received an estimate from our local innovation center that this could total as many as 13 or 14,000 workers who specifically have the ability to work remotely from anywhere in Ontario. Um, what we hope to offer is uh, building on the branding exercise 
that uh, future SSM has undertaken with work-life balance. We want to take that message and we want to take it directly to the people who um, have an easier ability to relocate and to appreciate uh, specifically the housing and the outdoor advantage that Sault Ste. Marie possesses. Um, we already have a population here in Sault Ste. Marie of people who do telecommute, who are remote workers, whether it's graphic artists or scientific researchers, software developers, proposal writers. Um, this is something that we, we, we do have here in Sault Ste. Marie, and most of those people are here because of the value of our low housing um, and our excellent transportation links with Toronto through, uh, through Porter and the investments we've made in our airport. Um, to speak specifically, um, the Workiva office in Sault Ste. Marie, one that, uh, of course, Councillor Vezuelan is well familiar with, started with one remote worker back in 2010. It is now um, a growing office of over 20 professionals who are remote workers, but who are living here in Sault Ste. Marie and contributing to our economy. And this is what we want to see more of with this task force. Thank you. Councillor Scott, did you want to speak to that as a seconder? Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. Uh, further to what Councillor Dufour was saying, um, when, when Councillor Vezo Allen came to me with this proposal, I knew that I had to jump on it uh, as a seconder, simply because I know a fair bit of people in town, um, be it working at Work Eva, for example, or other areas, and they get to do the remote work, and, and they choose Sault Ste. Marie because of family, because of our good work-life balance, because we're naturally gifted. Um, no matter which way, we have benefits here that you don't have in Toronto, um, not having to drive hours to get to work, having all of the, the beautiful surroundings. We're, time after time, we're named on lists for how beautiful the area is. And I really do think that this is a good potential opportunity to bring workers to the Sioux, back to the Sioux, and to keep them here. Uh, just having that, that scene of, of remote workers being here could also help. Um, they have the ability to ski in the winter. And I can go on and on. We know the benefits. I knew I had to jump on this, and I really do hope that it gets the support. Uh, I think we have great teams that Lisa has contacted in the Innovation Centre, the EDC, and the Future SSM group. So uh, I really do think this is a good opportunity for us, and I think it's a good opportunity for remote workers. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Uh, Councillor Hollingsworth? <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe um, just for clarification, um, I was thinking, I'm not sure who direct this to, but why just GTA? Can we do a friendly amendment? Uh, are we just targeting GTA or can we target all of Canada? Um, just, I want to understand why GTA. Councillor Dufour's microphone, Dominic. Sorry, um, I, I think the intention here is to pick a starting point with uh, a direct and clear mandate, and I don't see any reason why uh, it can't be expanded at a future date. Um, I don't think that that, uh, if it's successful, I don't think it would be beyond their mandate to, uh, to broaden the ge geographic area. But for the time being, I think that the reason the GTA was selected is because of um, the ease of our link uh, through Porter to Toronto flights, because uh, most people who work remotely um, they don't necessarily work 100% of the time remotely. You still have to go into the office, whether it's once every quarter or whatnot, to meet with your team. So, so uh, a quick and easy transportation link with uh, where the central office would be is, is an important component uh, to this recruitment effort. But I, once again, I, I see no reason why it can't be expanded at a later date. Okay, and I just have a comment um, to you. Want comments now, or are you continue on questions? I think we'll keep, we'll stay on questions. If that's okay. Okay. Councillor Verney. Um, I guess a question to Mr. Ver regarding um, the labor enforcement development officer by the name of Jonathan Coleman. Would this be his responsibility? I mean, we hired him through. Well, you hired him through Future Sault Ste. Marie. So. It, could this be a continuation for him to further investigate instead of, aren't we duplicating here? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni, uh, just a clarification, Paul Sayers is our uh, Labour Force Development oh, Coordinator. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes, we uh, talked with Councillor Vezo Allen about this resolution and the Innovation Centre in the EDC, and we do think that um, uh, this work 
uh, is complementary to the work we're doing with Future SSM and the Labor Force Development Coordinator. Uh, the website we're about to launch um, that would uh, attract people to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, with that said, uh, we do believe there is an opportunity with remote workers and there's an opportunity to uh, look at a campaign, you know, targeted to those remote workers. Uh, so we think those two things can go hand in glove together. And can Paul work on it? Instead of forming this committee between uh, EDC and um, Innovation Centre? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to Councillor Bruni, I, I believe the intent was Paul will be working on it, but we'll... Uh, um, leverage the, uh, the guidance and the input from the EDC and the Innovation Center in this process. So do we need a resolution for that, for them to work together, to work with Paul? I'm, I'm just asking, like, are we overloading them? Like, that, if it's his responsibility, his job, uh, why are we directing them? Uh, like, that's up to Mr. Vare to direct them, I guess. I'm, I'm just... <coughs> Seems like duplication work here, that's all. Mr. Rare? Through you, Madam Acting Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni. Um, I, I don't think it's duplication. I think really what it's doing, it's, it's um, uh, uh, bringing to the fore an opportunity uh, related to remote workers, and, and the group working together will uh, develop a plan they can bring back okay. for uh, remote workers. All right, no problem. Did you have a question or comment? I'd try to help answer Councillor Bruni's question, but if he's satisfied with Mr. Fair's answers, that's fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Any other questions? Moving on to comments, Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um, my comments is just very brief, just to, um, I think um, this is more, um, mentioned to Tom, Mr. Fair in the past, but there's a company called My View that the EDC is using to do target campaigning. And so if this is passed tonight, um, I would suggest that um, you talk to them because this group is very good at targeting the groups that we want here in Sault Ste. Marie. That's just one idea. Point two, another idea is if this is passed, um, 60 Minutes, CBS News, 60 Minutes, on May the 5th, I sent to you the link did a whole segment on work remotely. Tuska, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma wants you and your laptop to move here. And it was very good outlining what benefits these individuals receive by moving to this community. Um, maybe if this task force hypothetically is put together, someone may want to reach out to this particular city to get some input since they've already done this. There's also two other cities that have done similar to Oklahoma that I can send to you that you might want to reach out instead of reinventing the wheel. Um, so basically, just to conclude, direct targeting, I think, is your key success to this if this is passed. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Seeing none, uh, shall we proceed to vote? So to vote. I vote in favor. Okay. Okay, Madam Clerk, moving on. Moving on to agenda item 11, bylaws. I've got a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Scott, resolved that all bylaws under item 11 of the agenda under date June 17, 2019 be approved. All in favor? Uh, looks like that's carried. Okay. I'm in favor. I'll just close that vote.
and under agenda item 13, a motion by councillors Hollingsworth and Scott resolve that this council proceed into closed session to discuss proposed acquisition of property. Further be it resolved that should the said closed session be adjourned, the council may reconvene in closed session to continue to discuss the same matter without the need for a further authorizing resolution. All in favor? That's carried. I vote in favor. And under agenda item 14, a motion by councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy that this council now adjourn. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you.